Rishabh, welcome to the Lewis and Kyle show. I think we're going to have a lot of good stuff to talk about today. Yeah, I'm super excited about it. I guess uh, before we started recording, we batted back and forth a little bit about how some of the areas that you're building your business in have high overlap with uh, areas that I've worked in. And so I'm super excited about this conversation. Amazing. I want to start high level and let you kind of sell it to us in terms of the goal of Fermat and like what y'all are, the, the problem that you're trying to solve and then the solution you have at present. Yeah. So I think fundamentally the, the way that the e-commerce ecosystem especially has evolved over the last 10 years is Facebook was basically like e-commerce's sort of <laughs> like a catalyst, right? So all of a sudden you had an advertising platform where a brand that wanted to sell its products to a certain cohort of people could find that cohort very effectively. And so in doing that, all of a sudden there was a series of brands that realized I don't need to let the retailer eat all my margin. I can actually just use Facebook, find the people highly effectively. And even if I'm taking on that marketing cost, because it's small enough, I can actually then deliver the good directly to the customer. And then I get their user information and I can remarket them and sell them additional products. Right. So we had this decade long run of some of the largest D2C brands getting born as a consequence of this sort of marketing engine that was, that was created. And then Apple <laughs> made a decision about two years ago saying you're not allowed to track users from one website to another. Google is now going to remove the third party cookie. This is like a little bit on the technical side, but that was sort of married with this big force of the, of the creator and sort of user generated content also rising. Right? So you had these two massive forces that happened to coincide. One is you can't track people anymore. So this marketing engine has become less effective, but also where people are spending their time is with user generated content. And so these two things put together kind of lead you to the obvious outcome for what happens in e-com next, which is that people are going to buy things in, in content, you know, it's like I'm watching content or I'm in content or whatever it may be. And I'm going to make purchasing decisions based on the content that I'm spending my time consuming. And so the next wave of e-commerce is going to be shopping experiences or, you know, that are one-to-one -one or native to that content instead of this sort of, Hey, let's advertise and redirect everybody to a website. It's going to be more content native shopping. And, and that's like the, the way that, yeah, for these two big reasons that we just discussed are it's, it's going to evolve over the next 10 years. So let's get into, uh, and then I think one thing you left out, right. Is like also the pandemic coinciding with that same backstory. And I think the number I heard you say was like five Xing all growth estimates and just basically, I again, I don't know the numbers as well as you do, but like 10 Xing the market cap of this thing that was happening over here in a really, really compressed period. So not only were those things happening, but they're happening, you know, with an extra zero at the end or two extra zeros, or whatever it was. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I think that the biggest change that's lasting, cause like, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, the pandemic was a pull forward and now it's back to the mean. But the thing that has not changed is that behaviorally we're spending more time getting shopping ideas from content. So like, you're right. It, it got accelerated in a big way. And then the amount of like e-com shopping that's happening has declined, but the way that it's happening has actually not changed that, that actually got fundamentally shifted over the course of the pandemic. So where are you? attacking this from with your business? Cause I mean, there's again, trends in every direction to try to like <laughs> get a piece of the pie and build a business around it. Yeah, totally. I think that the part of this that we're trying to do is basically sort of deconstruct and distribute the notion of a website. So we are creating the shopping. So today the place where you would actually shop and buy the product is the brand's website. And what we're saying is how about we help you make it possible for you to put somebody into a shopping experience that's native to content. So whether that's 
directly embedded inside of content or one-to-one -one with that content. So we don't actually uh, do like sort of creator matching. We don't do content creation. We provide the sort of infrastructure tools to make it possible that you can actually create shopping experiences in this native way. And so that's the layer of the stack that we sit in. So basically what that means is for the customers we work with, they already have like content creators or people who make their content that who they work with. And we just sort of turbocharge that engine with this like unique shopping experience for every piece of content that they create. And there's a difference for the person that's consuming content for the way that it currently works is go to link in my bio, right? Where you get taken somewhere where they're not comfortable. But if you can give them a native place with a creator that they are comfortable with and that they feel like they know, they're much more likely to convert into a sale, which is good for both the influencer and for the Shopify backend or whatever the backend company that's selling it. They, it, It's a win for both people. And the influencer has the ability to better track the sales that they are attributable to. That's exactly right. So, and I think you characterized it basically perfectly. Like, let's just say I'm like, hey, I see Kyle is wearing a Titleist hat, right? And for whatever reason, I've never heard of that company before. It's like, actually, the reason why I want to buy that hat is like, I can see it on him. It's like, it looks good. And, you know, I'm like, I'm already sold basically, right? And and now when you sort of like redirect me to the site and now I'm like in this like website that has like a thousand other SKUs, like a, a thousand other products, in fact, you've actually made it harder for me to do the purchase, right? Instead, why not just like put me into a, an experience where I continue to see Kyle wearing the hat and I just click on the item or set of items that are relevant and learn whatever information. So it's like, let's just say there happens, I mean, hat is a bad example because there's no sizing in hats, but let's just pretend it's a sweater. And it's like, okay, great. All I need to do is be able to select my size, select my quantity, and then check out and not get distracted. And to no surprise, that's way more effective than landing somebody on yet a different experience that, you know, it's like now you have to reconvince the person, basically. All right, I have a, a lot of thoughts on this, kind of like I was, I was saying. Uh, so I have like a series of questions I'm going to try to ask concisely. Is there a minimum revenue range, I guess, where you are currently right now in terms of the level of difficulty to make customized buying experiences in terms of both the landing page, but also following all the way through multiple steps in the funnel? Uh, is there a certain like threshold of size of brand where this level of effort is rewarding in terms of like, you know, for example, if a website is only getting 10,000 visits per month and this, or basically probably the other way to frame it would be like the amount of visits that influencer is driving per month. And I guess also like a multiple in terms of like average order value. But I've been in discussions with one of the brands I've been working with. It's an accessory for laptops. And, you know, I was saying, do you have a split test in terms of like, you know, if this person's seeing your ad on an Apple device versus if this person's seeing your ad on a Windows device, do you bring them to a landing page that has an Apple device or a Windows device? Because right, you want the customer to see themselves represented in the end outcome. And so like, that's something we're already doing. But again, it's like not efficient, but it's like, basically the question is like, you could go all the way down the rabbit hole, right? So you like, then you, cause you can segment on gender. Like, is it worth making four landing pages now? Because like right now you have the, you want to have a woman with an Apple device in the ad versus a man with an Apple device in the ad. And then it, you could like really kind of make the permutations of this blow up. It's like, where's the threshold where this is worth the effort? And does your yeah. tool maybe reduce the threshold as well? Yeah, yeah. So our tool makes the threshold uh, b basically close to zero. So I, I actually think the way you described it is exactly why I'm excited about the tech that we've built. So on average, you would have to build a landing page and there's like actual real effort in standing up a unique landing page for every single one. And then most landing pages, you still actually go to the main site after you hit the landing page because the checkout is actually on the main site. It doesn't live within the landing page. So we've actually made it like trivial to 
uh, create a store for every single piece of content. So we, we stand up like hundreds of stores basically in no time. And so basically we've done a lot of automation to make it one-to-one -one with every piece of content. So actually the limiting factor is like, how diverse is your, is your content engine? Uh, not how, not, not the landing, not the not lander the or not the, not the shopping experience. Yeah. 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 That, because we've, really we've just built it in, in like such a, in such a way to make it actually sort of like trivially distributable. Yeah. The other, the other interesting thing that you brought up was like, Hey, you know, you have this type of demographic who hits, or like, let's just say Apple user versus Mac user, or sorry, Apple user versus Windows user, right? Is like your, your splits. Um, I think that that's like exactly the right way to think about it because how you would configure it in, in, in your ad buy is you could actually trivially split your Apple user and your Mac user, right? Cause like actually ads get shown or bought based on what the device type is. Right. And so you could actually do this trip very, very trivially. And in the ad copy or ad asset, you would trivially create two types of, of copy or imagery. Right. So like, actually that's exactly how we think about it, which is to the extent that you can segment on the customer acquisition on the advertising side, that's exactly how much you should segment on the shopping experience side. And that's sort of like our whole thesis. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll I pause there. Huge, but... no, yeah. I was struggling to think of this as well, but like age in terms of layers of representation to making an ad resonate. It's like, if this laptop accessory, the person you're seeing, right. Uses the different ecosystem and is 20 years younger than you. You're like, oh, this is for young high tech people that use Apple devices. I'm like a consultant in my fifties who's always been on PC and you're just not going to like resonate with it. Can you speak to any of the, so yeah, I would say that's another dimension, like that if you've made it much more easy, like I'm definitely going to share this with the, the founder of that, like the person I'm working with, because if this just simplifies the process of facilitating, building all of these different SKUs, I'm using the term SKU in terms of like these different variations of yeah, purchasing yeah, funnels, it, yeah. then that would be really interesting to discuss. And do you have, I guess, like embedded analytics for the different SKUs and any terms of like initial results you can speak to in terms of this being worth the effort? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that we didn't expect, so we actually built the company on the premise that we would be able to collect data that today is very hard to collect. So, and I think you'll have a strong appreciation for this. So in today's world, let's just say you're running five different types of ads or five campaigns, right? And then the UTM param on each campaign, which, uh, you know, for the listeners who are not as like sort of deep in, in ads, that's basically just the way that the URL, when you redirect to the website, tells you which ad the person came from. So it's like ad one, you go to the website, there's something called a UTM param. It basically passes to the browser, oh, this person came from ad one. Now, once you're on that uh, brand's website, you, you know, you click around and then you eventually make a purchase, right? And so the way that the website knows who made the purchase is that UTM param gets written into what's called a cookie, which is sort of like, you know, you get that little banner saying like, hey, allow cookies. And then that cookie sends the data back to the ad network. So like Facebook, for example, right? So Facebook, there are five different ads running. Ad one is the one that causes the transaction. The cookie gets read by Facebook's pixel, which is, you know, a piece of tech that's on the browser and then sends the data back to Facebook. Okay. So, so why did I do, why did I just sort of talk through all this? One of the things that you cannot do, or that's like extremely hard to do is once you're on the website, most brands want to do what's called funnel analytics. So for every person who lands on this page, what did they click on next? What is the likelihood that they add to cart? What is the likelihood that they check out, right? And so they do funnel analytics. But what they don't do is they don't do funnel analytics on a per ad basis, because that would be very hard to do. Because then you would have- That's to exactly what we're ad. doing right now, which is, it's, it's, it's been, hey, my buddy's been, we have five, he has like a double curve monitor stacked and like he's a full, you know, senior software engineer and we're doing it because again, this brand has the ad threshold and the budget where it is worth paying someone with that skill set to do. But it's exactly. like, it's yeah. Hard. And then the custom because... tagging within GA4 to be able to take everything through, 
Like you're just not going to be able to do that out of the box. So like we've actually been putting in the effort, but I'm curious to hear like the consequence of what so, you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Okay. So this is awesome. So, you know, exactly. So like for, for listeners, this is like a very hard thing to do. Right. So like exactly what Lewis is saying, it's like, you have to go through the work of actually defining every step in your funnel associated with that UTM param that comes in based on you actually identifying it in the tag that you have put on your website. Okay. So this is like every one of these funnels is getting set up manually in essence, right? That's like kind of what's happening in, in the background. And so like you have to actually go through the work to do this. If you're sort of trying to do this now in, in the way that we have operated is we have actually said there's a unique shopping experience where we add. So what does that mean? That means your full funnel analytics, you don't have to do any of this work. It's out of the box. Out of the box, you can do full funnel analytics on a per ad set basis, which is like kind of incredible. So like you would know exactly how much time this would save, right? Like imagine if everything that you're doing in terms of tagging on the core website, it just was like automated for free. And now actually the only job to do is to take that data and pipe it into a visualization tool. And that's like, and that's, and that's it. And like now the brand now, like, of course the brand is still going to need help, like actually doing the analysis and things like that. And so there's still businesses to be built on the data, but you have to spend zero time on the setup of the collection of the data because it's just out of the box by definition. Are you only for Shopify stores at present? We do uh, three platforms right now, Shopify, Recharge, and Cord. And then later this year, we'll be doing BigCommerce and Salesforce Commerce. Super interesting. So, yeah. Go ahead, Kyle. To bring it back to the user and the, the, the relationship between the user and the influencer, am I going to from a advertisement? Like, let's say uh, a brand pays me to advertise shorts and I post a photo of me in these shorts. As the person who is consuming this content from this influencer, I click on those shorts. I, am I going to a Fermat based landing page that is a influencers, an influencers branding, but like their, it, it's a continuation of their story that is, exactly. uh, that is like piped back to the Shopify store or cord or recharge or whatever. You got it exactly right. Okay. That is exactly what the experience feels like. It feels continuous. It feels seamless. And of course we do a bunch of things to like, you know, get the transaction to happen fast too. Right. So we simplify a little bit of the checkout, uh, but that what you described is exactly right in terms of the user journey. Also, also, I kind of love that we went down this like nerdy data rabbit hole <laughs> and Kyle was like, Hey, guys like let's zoom back out you know it's like hey we got to talk about the user what does the experience feel like uh so i kind of love that yeah yeah if you didn't do that i was going to ask you about like okay if you also have you know the in terms of the <laughs> exactly the point you know what i mean so i was like going to keep going down the analytics hole indefinitely so this is this is very interesting and this is uh, i think the i don't know the date of the podcast you're on but this is post where's the startup in terms of launch and yeah, like active customers are, and people using this. Yeah. Yeah. So we uh, started the company like sort of like incorporation and funded only 14 months ago. Uh, and then we did our launch with our like alpha customers in September. And then we were in beta through Q4. Um, yeah. And our Q4 was like, uh, I would say it was like our moment, so to speak. So at the start of Q4, I would say we were doing like a trickle amount of GMV, you know, like a couple thousand bucks of GMV every week. And GMV is gross merchandise value. So it's basically like for the e-com brands that we support, how much of the sales are happening because of our pipes, basically. Right. And so we were like in trickle territory at the start of Q4. And then by the end of Q4, uh, we were doing like double digit millions of, of annualized GMV. So we had like kind of like 100x growth in the course of 12 weeks. Yeah, and and sort of like I would say that that was our like like you Reflection know, point. okay, we have a product that works type of thing. This and so is just, 
did the systems that you built to handle the trickle did they scale with that 100x growth yeah that's incredible that's yeah. a testament to so your, in, in, yeah go ahead in fact what i would say is we didn't even know that that was going to happen because basically like the way that our product works is like it's so high roi for the brand that when they see it working they just put a lot of leverage into the channel through like paid media or whatever else they're doing in order to like get people to land on the experience. And so they just started to do that without talking to us also because it was the holidays, right? And so like yeah. literally in the last two weeks of December, it like it like three X in the last two weeks of December alone. You know what I mean? Because like we had no awareness and these people were just like, holy smokes, this thing is working, let's go. And, and they just dialed it all the way up, which is sort of, yeah, I mean, I mean, we hit a number that was like, yeah, I mean, it was like, very, I, I truly did not think that we would get anywhere close to that, basically. Yeah. That's amazing. I want to ask you in terms of getting in front of people. I know that you had a very deliberate, slow, steady cycle of like prompt discovery, solution discovery, and pre-sale. Were you yeah. pretty white glove with like these first people? In terms of like, oh. like, yeah, is there like, I guess in like the, the second half of the question is like, is there a business for someone to basically go to brands and be like, Hey, let me set you up on Vermont and revenue share. Like how much, like a growth consultant basically, like, is that like a use case you anticipate or are encouraging? And before yeah. you, in that answer, the people that you're being white glove with, is that the brands or is that the influencers? Okay. Yeah. Great question. So actually we don't have a product that is direct to influencers anymore. So one of the things that we realized is actually our brands who we work with want to actually be the ones who are sort of like managing the process and then they manage it and then they do whatever they need to with the influencer. So the relationship between the brand and the influencer, we don't sort of intermediate in any way. So the brand is the one using the product. To the earlier question around like implementation and scaling of Fermat, actually one of our best sources of partnerships that's starting to emerge is growth agencies, basically. And so what we're learning is that people who were traditionally sort of like their focus was, hey, we'll help you with your ad buy on like Facebook and Google and TikTok. We're starting to work with them to like help them move their brands to using Fermat experiences associated with that. And they're managing all of the sort of like implementation and an ongoing growth around the use of the Fermat channel. So that's like, you're exactly right. That's actually like a big part now of the growth strategy. Now that we're actually sort of trying to grow the number of, of uh, brand end customers. You had to penetrate some, uh, some masterminds of like, agencies that all do the same type of thing. That's like my first idea. Yeah. I, yeah. What, one of the things that I have found super interesting is like actually just dovetailing off of that is it's a, it's a, our product is not easy to understand. And so trying to find great agency partners is actually very hard. And so, yeah, that is like one of the things that we're sort of figuring out right now is like, what is the best fit type of agency? And then what is the enablement that we need to be responsible for to make sure that we can be successful together, right? So yeah, it's like, that's exactly the zone of problem that we're in right now. Super interesting. Uh, I think one question that listeners might have for this, and it depends, like I haven't recorded the introduction yet where I like give some more context about you than you've provided, but like academically, you have a very accomplished scientific, like I'd say difficult background. And just even the way you talk and like the, the things you talk about, like you don't seem like the type of guy who's spending all day on Instagram and TikTok. Like I feel like the a lot of the people who have like the stereotype, <laughs> right? <laughs> the stereotype you of like you don't seem like the kind of guy who spends all day on TikTok. <laughs> I that's you know, there's like there are compliments that you would have never thought are like this is like a great compliment. But it's like, of, of all the compliments I could have received, that has got to feel, it honestly feels great. You know, it's like so weird to interact with that, with that <laughs> statement. I love it. Thank you. Well, the yeah. opposite is just a pretty brutal insult, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you seem like the kind of guy who spends all day on TikTok. <laughs> 
<laughs> you you have two thousand followers, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, sorry, I should let you finish your question. I I'm sorry for interrupting. No, no, no. I, I love that. It's a great moment. I think just, but in general, like the stereotype is like you know TikTok not necessarily conducive to like higher order thought and like you know to use like the Cal Newport term that's gone very mainstream like deep work and like you know it's not a traditionally like ac- like academic rigor type thing. Like those are just not words I put in the same word cloud, right? Like the TikTok word cloud and then like the PhD word cloud. Like I don't it's see like, like a lot of. Uh, you're not the end user. How did you think of this? That's where I'm going. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I got it. Got it's it. It's like you're not like looking at, you know, dudes wearing t- like Bad Birdie is like a company who's headquartered really close to me, and like it's like the most douchey frat bro golf brands from Scottsdale, and it's hilarious. It's great, but like I, I don't feel like you're sitting on your couch looking at Bad Birdie's Instagram. Like watching dudes basically like <laughs> drink beers on the golf course and being like, I just wish I could buy his t-shirt right now. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I guess uh, yeah. I guess there's like two things. So one is yeah, so like you you had mentioned, I had gotten my PhD in solid state physics. And so after my PhD, one of the things that I, I always knew that I did not want to become a professor. I always knew I wanted to be in the world of business. And what I slowly learned about myself in my first job after my PhD was I think like one of the things that I'm good at is asking questions and not being attached to the answer being a certain way beforehand. So I'm like, you know, because it kind of gets beaten out of you if you're going to be a good scientist, right? It's like nature's going to do whatever nature wants to do, no matter what you think it should do. Right. And so like, if you're a scientist, you kind of have no choice but to, if you're a good scientist, you kind of have no choice but to like get used to this behavior pattern where you have, you all you can do is run a bunch of experiments and then sort of allow the truth to reveal itself, right? And that's like actually very, very similar to what people will characterize as like, oh, you know, you got to iterate fast in, in, in a startup. But it's actually hard to do that. And the reason it's hard to do that is failing sucks. <laughs> right it's like it's actually not fun to fail it's not fun to be wrong it's like you know it's like you're building a business you 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 know this as well as anybody it's like hey when you go out and pitch when the person says no it kind of it sucks there's nothing there's no there's nothing good about that feeling when you're like man i am so sure i can help this company and they're still saying no to me right that it's a shitty feeling and so i think like uh, I, I'm fortunate that, that that got beaten into me in, in my PhD. And so that's sort of the approach that I take to, to business building. Okay, so how is that attached to TikTok, right? Basically, we talked about this like Apple change that happened, right? And so actually my approach to building in this ecosystem was technically driven. So I started with the problem statement, and this is, Lewis, something you said earlier, which is, you know, I have this very clear process of like, what is the problem? Detach that from the solution and detach that from the pre-sale. And so I started very clearly with a single problem, which is you can no longer track users from one place to another on the internet. That's a big, big problem for the uh, way that the internet can you, works. Can today. you add the specific context for like when that happens? So that's basically like, because that's not like a gradual change. There was like a, a moment in time where you could and oh. a moment in time where you couldn't. Yeah, and like totally. That moment so, was iOS 14, is it 14.5 or... Exactly, exactly. So, yeah. well, actually, um, what happened was in the Worldwide Developer Conference in June of 2020, Apple made the announcement saying it is going to happen. And then in 2021, they actually implemented the change in the summer. And then by the time mass adoption happened, it was 14.6 or 14.7 because they did, you know, like when Apple does this thing where it like automatically updates versus when it doesn't, they actually intentionally do this. And so by the time they did the auto update, it was call it September of 2021. And that was it, you know, that, that was when like everybody's ad effectiveness started to go down big time. Right. And so this thing happened where it was like particular moments in time that led up to it. Um, but for me, I was like, I saw the announcement in June of 2020 and that's when the wheel started turning. I left my job in early 2021 and then started the company at the end of 2021. Yeah. So the role you were in to kind of like what we were saying earlier in terms of finding a good agency to understand this, right? It's like 
certain things, just certain people in certain situations are going to be in the position to understand the significance of, right? I mean, that change affected a billion people overnight and not a billion people started a company to do something about it. It's like the position you were in at live ramp to reuse the word position, like mentally you kind of saw a different perspective that like made the significance clear. Exactly right. Exactly right. In fact, I would say that everybody who I talked to in the beginning of 2021, so I left my job in January of 2021. And then I just started talking to people. I started talking to brands, you know, like started just like understand how, like you were saying, problem discovery. And I'll tell you, like very few people thought that it was going to be a big problem. (laughs) It was like, but there was just enough that you could tell that they were like, it was like nagging them a little bit. Like, yeah, you know, like I'm starting to see some weird things in my Facebook CPA, uh, like cost per acquisition, right? Because it hadn't, it hadn't fully by mid 2021. So, cause it hadn't fully rolled out yet, but it was like, ah, you know, like Facebook will figure it out. You know, my agency will figure it out. Everybody's saying they'll figure it out. And so like, I could actually see in people's articulation of the problem, it went from Look, by the way, when I was talking to VCs at the beginning of 2021 and I told them like, oh, yeah, this thing is going to like be a dramatic shift. They were just like, oh, yeah, it's going to re- like increase the cost a little bit. Like the number of people who did not believe me was like 99 percent of people did not believe me. You know what I mean? And it, it was it was like kind of unbelievable. You like walk around and you're like, am I the idiot? <laughs> you know, that's like and, and like most founders feel this way. Right. It's just like, man, like. Am I wrong or is or are they not seeing it? quite yet right and so you you just kind of have to like really be deliberate about continuing to like ask the question and and keep going but yeah you're exactly right it was i was lucky that i had enough knowledge about the ecosystem to have high confidence that my view was correct and it was a matter of time before it played out it's one of those things the analogy I've heard again, Cal Newport actually talk about when he talks about like who should write a book, it's like one, you have to have something to say that's interesting. And two, you have to be like the right person to say it. So I think like there's like a a parallel analogy with business. It's like, you have to be the person to have an idea, but also like in the position to actually execute it and like understand the various factors at play. One kind of specific question. It's more like a resume question. I saw that like at live ramp, you'd like started three different businesses internally, but I didn't really get any deeper than that. Like what were those so like, this is like your first company, well, not your first company you started, but like one of the companies you started independently, but you've also started three companies beforehand within a broader organization. So what did those do? Yeah. Yeah. So basically inside of LiveRamp, LiveRamp has a very interesting story actually. So LiveRamp got acquired by a company called Axiom in 2015 and then divested the parent company in 2018, uh, sorry, in 2019 to become an independent public company. Right. So uh, LiveRamp itself has a very interesting story. The moment, the reason I share that is when it became independently public, one of the things that we decided to do was like to build this new business team. And I was responsible for this new business team. And there were three uh, specific new businesses that we built. One was in healthcare. One was through an acquisition of a company that did consent management. So it was basically a privacy business. And then the third one was in podcasting. And the core idea was like, Hey, what are some new different businesses that we can build using some of the assets that LiveRamp has? So either the identity asset or the customer relationships or whatever, like there are advantages to building a a business inside of a company, which is there's a set of assets that you can take advantage of in order to accelerate a new business. And so, yeah, those were the, those were the three businesses that we built. I have a question about, so you were, how long did your education take from high school till, um, the end of your PhD? Too long. (laughs) I started high school in 2001 and then I graduated my PhD in 2015. So, so yeah. In the years. period of time where you're graduate from college and getting your PhD, while you know that you want to start a business, how did you mentally handle like learning about extremely difficult concepts within physics 
and knowing that you didn't want to do you didn't want to be a professor or, or be an academic like that i've had similar experiences but i'm only 23 and i haven't had that long of a period of time where i was doing something like that so what was that like for you yeah it's a good question so i should start off by saying i love physics so what to some people might sound like painful right to like study and spend time doing physics i'm i get like incredible joy out of and and i always have like starting in middle school in fact uh and so so actually like it was purely hedonistic to go like i, I it was like a selfish hedonistic move to go do a phd I was like, hey, I just want to do the thing that I get the most joy out of. And that's why I decided to go do a PhD in physics, right? So it actually had nothing to do with my career ambitions and everything to do with like, when I look back on my life, am I going to regret not doing the thing that I get joy out of? And so that's, so that's why I did it despite knowing that I wanted to go build businesses, right? Because uh, it was joyful. And, and while I was doing it, I actually did start a couple of companies, during, both of which failed during my PhD and that gave me enough of a flavor of like, okay, there's a couple of things I need to get much better at before I give it a real shot at starting a business. And so after my PhD, I actually took like literally an entry level job, uh, at, at live ramp before I sort of like grew inside of the company. What was the entry level job? I was doing support. I was like on the support team. Yeah, so like when customers have questions and problems, I was just an individual contributor receiving support questions. And that's where we started there. It's a really interesting, very, very interesting story. I want to do some rapid fire bonus questions with these last 10 or so minutes we have and just go from there. Uh, I saw somewhere on your Twitter that, or maybe it wasn't Twitter, Twitter, LinkedIn, social media, wherever, uh, that your new father, how's that yeah. inf influenced everything? I guess like everything business, personal, changed opinions about anything in terms of career, timing, how aggressive you're pushing, pushing more aggressive, more relaxed, just the reframe. Yeah, totally. Yeah, for me personally, first of all, I love being a dad, but for me personally, it's like a fill the bucket, empty the bucket type of thing. And so like spending time with my daughter like fills my bucket emotionally. And so it actually allows me to be more effective in the workplace. So. I think that that's like one dimension of it. And then the second dimension of it is like, I have this view of if once you have a kid, there is finally somebody else in the world who you care about more than yourself. Like, I think if most of us were being honest, it's pretty hard to make the truthful statement that you care about somebody else more than yourself, right? It's like the rare human who actually has that characteristic. But when you have a kid, it's like actually the common human who has somebody else who they care about more than themselves. And I think that that allows you to like make decisions in a fundamentally different way at, at the workplace that I think is like accretive in the long term. So I think those are the two ways that it has like shaped the way that I behave at work and at home. I love that. That's a really, really fantastic answer. Would it have been in your opinion, impossible to start this business without VC funding or self, if, or if you were also like a high net worth in it, basically without huge reserves. Yeah, I think yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's kind of unfortunate that the answer, you, you know, sometimes you kind of want to wish that the answer is no, you know what I mean? Like you kind of want to wish that like, okay, yeah, it's possible to bootstrap, but there are certain things that just take investment. Yeah. And, and usually those things are where there is a core piece of tech that needs to be developed in order for you to actually be able to accomplish the like first order of business. And that's true for us. Like, like you, you know, this, like building a, like if, if, if all we did was like start with building landing pages is super non-scalable, right? It's like a ton of work to do all the analytics. It's like a ton of work. And it's like, yeah, I, I mean, you could you could do that, at, but it's it, it's very time consuming, you know, and it's like a different type of business to do that. And so we have to invest in a technology core that allows us to, yeah, like, you know, stand up a store every two minutes and have these like deep analytics out of the box, right? And and if like that's the that's what drives the business and what drives the scale, then 
you have to have investment up front, unfortunately, right? So I don't want to, I don't want to like say like, oh yeah, you know, you could do it with like a 10x engineer. Like I, I just don't think you could do it. Yeah. Do you have, so we had a podcast probably two or three months ago and the lady was talking about the power of breakfast meetings. And I think most people have a meeting that comes to mind that was a real turning point for them. And it doesn't have to be breakfast, maybe a coffee, definitely not a dinner. But do you have something that comes to mind as a real turning point for you throughout your life, your career, where somebody said something to you or, or you know, just really shifted your course? Man, I've had so many. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try to pick. Okay, let me see how to answer this the most effectively. I'll, I'll, I'll share, I'll share like two stories very quickly that I, that I think stand out as like a meeting with a person that like really shifted my view. So one was I was having coffee with a friend of mine. He happens to be the CEO of a company called materialize. It's like a streaming database company. He's a very successful. Now he's a successful entrepreneur at the time. He was just like getting this thing started. And he said to me, like, man, Rishab, you've got to understand that like with your background and like the kinds of things that you're going to be able to do and the way that you operate, if you, whenever you decide to start a company, you're going to be very attractive for people to invest in. And it's hard to know that, right? If you're the person and if you've never had that exposure, this was way before I ever like was considering leaving Libram, right? This is actually like 2017. So this is like, you know, four years before. And so when I finally ended up, uh, that, that like kind of stuck with me in a very big way. So when I finally ended up deciding to leave, he was the first person I called. And then the consequences of that were like, he's actually the one who introduced me to the person who invested the very first capital, like big check into the company. Right. And so like, that was like a, a standout moment in terms of like those types of meetings where you're just like, okay, like I have an appreciation for something that I, that I did not have previously. I think the other big like moment for me in terms of meetings was there was a, uh, yeah, I, I think like there was a moment where the person who ended up funding our company, I was like talking with him about the co-founder search. Cause I left without like big plan. I didn't have a co-founder, you know, I was just sort of like running through ideas. And he said to me, Rishab, this business deserves an amazing co-founder. And it's like, again, it was one of those other moments when you're business building that you, your temptation to like say, oh, this person is like great on paper, but it's like not quite the amazing fit that you would hope for. And it's just like to hear the words like this business deserves an amazing co-founder. You're like, it reframes your thinking around like, okay, I need to be looking for something meaningfully different that can like really move the needle on this business. So those are the two meetings. I hope that actually like is like kind of in the zone of what you were looking for, but those are the two that really stand out to me. That was a hundred percent the kind of answer we were looking for. Rishab, awesome. Where sh uh, I think we're coming up on time. Where can people, if they're interested, read about this, learn about this, learn about you, etc. Yeah. So our company is just firmatcommerce.com, and I'm just Rishab M Jane is just my name on both Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, and I'm pretty active on both. Amazing. Thank you so much. It's been a blast. Yeah. Thank you guys. This has been really fun.